Welcome to Velocity Work Live, where we interview guests who have reached success on their own terms and are not hustling. They're not in a grinding phase. They may have goals. They may be reaching for things, but they're in a very different space than when they were first lifting their business off the ground. And so there's no better guest to bring on than Ernie Svensson of Law Firm Autopilot. Ernie, the attorney. Thank you for being hey, here with me. Oh, thank you for having me. And wow, I mean, that's like, uh, I have a lot to live up to here. I don't think I can. I'm not the I, best, but I oh certainly am happy to be here. You you are the perfect example to me of someone who, and I want to actually talk to you about the early stages of when you were getting the business off of the ground, but I've had many conversations with you and you are so chill about mm. A lot, like you don't have a graspiness with your business. There's no mm -hmm. desperation. You don't need something from your business. It's mm -hmm. just, it's running the way it's running. And of course you do new things. And of course you're shooting for it's, it's, there's a, there's a fulfillment there in what you're doing and kind of playing with things and really enjoying the growth that's happening mm -hmm. instead of needing the growth, needing more customers, needing the income, which you know, when you're first starting out, most people do need some of that, right? Yeah. So, so let's go back to yeah. when you were first lifting off the ground law from autopilot or your own thing. Maybe it wasn't called that right away, mm -hmm. but you know, when you made the call to make that switch, make that jump and you were just starting this off, if I were to ask you, it feels like a loaded question, but <laughs> if I were to ask you, how did you lift this thing off the ground? Like, tell us about that. Like the very first year, for example. Yeah. Well, the first, okay. So it, it started with me leaving the big firm that I went into after I got out of law school, clerked for a judge for two years, and then went to the big fancy tall building law firm because they paid a lot of money. They did interesting work. I never thought that you know, I could ever, you know, work in such a place because I had historically always been a really bad student until I got to law school. And I was just kind of exhilarated by and intoxicated would be a better word by the idea that, you know, I could go into this world. And so, you know, I had major imposter syndrome, mm. but then I quickly figured out like, well, you know, actually I know stuff. I can figure stuff out most importantly and a lot of people here are faking it and not making it. And, you know, it's okay. So, you know, I, I did, you know, went reverted to my usual, okay, it's fine if I fall down a few times and trip up and things like that. So once I realized that, you know, it's, it's not a game that could be mastered, either the practicing of law or the running of the business. Um, I, you know, I just started to feel more embattled by the overhead, the bureaucracy, the excess, the lumbering quality of it. And I guess I realized, you know, that I had accidentally gone into a place that really wasn't suited for me because I'm more, you know, entrepreneurial, innovate, don't do things just for the sake of doing them the way they've always been done. So it started to frustrate me to be in a big firm, but I really didn't know how I was gonna leave. And then Katrina, Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans. And I realized like a lot of the things I thought were benefits were actually deficits in the big firm. Their mm -hmm. exceptional resources only worked in the tall building and not anywhere else. And the people only could work together in the tall building and nowhere else. And people depended on each other and couldn't figure things out for themselves and weren't self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. And my nature growing up, you know, because of my upbringing, my background, I had to figure things out as a kid and at first I didn't like it, but you know, it turns out to be a good life skill. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what all set me up to say, okay, I'm going to go out on my own. Cause I just can't take this anywhere. It wasn't, I had no plan. I was just like, where's the ejector seat push, you know, hope the parachute works. And then I started figuring out how to be a solo lawyer. And then from there I started figuring out how to be a non-lawyer who helps people uh, using technology teaching so, them technology. Okay. Okay. Take me back to when you were starting the business. I mean, was it a clean cut or was there a transition? 
Um, it was pretty clean cut because I, I remember this moment <laughs> vividly. Uh, it was Katrina happened. The city had been evacuated for six weeks. Nobody could come back in the built in the city, but I managed to squeak in and the firm, you know, was like, yeah, okay, fine. If you want to try to work from New Orleans, that's great. And I was just, you know, in my house and I was sitting in the back yard and it was a blue sky, beautiful day, crisp, nice weather, perfect weather. And the phone rang and it was my friend, you know, from law school, but he was on the compensation committee of the firm and he's calling to do the yearly, you know, hey, um, what do you want me to tell the compensation committee? So this is this whole political move. Like, you know, it's like a politician. They go around and ask everybody, how do you want me to advocate your case? As though they're only advocating for you, right? <laughs> because they're advocating for everybody, but this is like a show that they put on. And, you know, he was my friend, but, you know, he had a role. And so he had to play that role. And I was like, oh God, here we go again with this stuff. And I was like, well, I didn't really have a great year last year. I'm thinking in my head, as I'm, you know, he's asked me this question and I'm probably not going to have another good one because I'm, I am not into this anymore. I am into figuring out technology and I'm figuring into figuring out how to be self-sufficient, which is diametrically opposed to everything that, that's going on in this firm. And I, I swear, literally the words came out of my mouth that I was thinking, but hadn't planned to say, Yeah, <laughs> and I was just trying it on. I said, well, Steve, you know, I had a really bad year last year. I'm probably gonna have another bad year this year. He's like, and he, he calls me Sven. And he's like, Sven, like, really? I mean, you, that we want me to tell him. And it was like, I mean, I think of the movie Office Space where the guy just starts to live a different life and it's insane. That was literally the same thing for me. I was just like, yeah, fine. I'm just gonna like say what's on my mind. And if they fire me, they fire me, you know? And he's like, well, okay, you know, and then so he didn't accept that as an answer. Like, well, that's not really going to work. What, I mean, what are you really thinking here? I was like, and then I said the thing that I'd played with this thought a lot, but I never had committed to it in my head. And I said, well, Steve, actually, you know, I'm thinking what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave and go out on my own. So it doesn't really matter what you tell him. I'm leaving to go out on my own and start a solo practice that like blew him away. Cause we were good friends and we de generally shared this information and I mean, I was as shocked as he was because I really, but I just couldn't take it anymore. And that's what I mean by I pushed the ejector button. That was the moment. And what's funny is he was like, well, you know, I'm going to tell him the meetings in like, you know, three days. So if you change your mind, let me know. I said, no, I'm not going to change my mind, you know, and he was very hesitant, but he, we hung up and I remember thinking, wow, I pushed the ejector button and I sat back and I looked up at that sky and I was like, wow, I feel such relief. Oh. And I thought, how can you feel relief? You don't have a plan. You just thought of this. You could never go and tell people that this is a way that they should do it. No one else should ever do it this way. I, you know, I don't know, maybe I should have done something different, but it worked for me because I pushed the button. I escaped. I started my own practice that worked. I used technology. I mean, part of it was I wanted to prove like either this technology stuff is really going to help solo lawyers practice in a different way. And I'm going to be one of the early guinea pigs into space and they'll, I'll either die in space, you know, like the first dog they sent up into space or I'll survive. And then I'll go, okay, well that worked. Let's keep doing it. And so it worked. And then other lawyers wanted to know, well, wait a second, I, I want to do what you're doing. You seem pretty chill and you seem like you have a really, um, you know, few moving parts less stressful way of practicing I'm like yeah i do i don't have any paper i don't need an office it's pretty damn good and i can do a lot of stuff from anywhere and so they asked me to show them what i could do you know how i'd done it i did people kept inviting me to speak eventually they started paying me to speak and i thought huh there's a business model here hmm. okay so wow before you even said um <clears throat> before right before you said the, I had thought these things, but they came out of my mouth. And then I was thinking, oh my gosh, that I was thinking as you're sharing the conversation, what guts it takes. It wasn't guts. It was well, not well, guts. That, that, so then you clarified. Yeah. It so was can, not guts. Like, it was overwhelmed. I just yeah. couldn't take it yeah. anymore. I, the, it was just so much BS. 
yeah. so much ridiculous, unnecessary stuff. And I was just like, I can't be here anymore. I yeah. have to be somewhere else. I mean, it was during Katrina, I even toyed, like I would have these fantasies of like, oh, well, I just want to, what was the last really good job I had before I even entered law? I was like, oh, it's waiting tables. Oh, restaurants need waiters. I could go back to waiting tables. That's how desperate in my mind I was to do something yeah. different than what I was doing. Of course, waiting tables is in no way going to approximate the compensation I needed, you know, so yeah. that, did, that idea wasn't the one. Okay. I so how long adopted. after that did you quit? Oh, well, right. So right then and there, that, that conversation was in late February, mid -feb, mid February. And he said, well, and that was another question. He said, well, when do you thinking you're going to go out on your own? And again, I'm thinking he's thinking I'm going to say six months. I said, um, next March, you know, like, which was next month, which gave me like three weeks to get ready. And I thought, that's it. That's, you know, if I don't do it fast, I mean, yeah. I kind of knew instinctively, if I don't do it fast, if I give myself more time to think about it, I'll find reasons why it doesn't make sense. And of course, people came to see me and say, oh, you know, you, we want you to stay, you could be of counsel and have your, you know, we can do whatever you want to do. So that you stay, we like you, we want you to stay, you know, just make it. And I was like, no, I've tried everything I can here to make it work like but you guys don't like technology you don't get it you don't want to use it and look at Katrina you're all running around in circles trying to you know find your little black book that you left back on your desk or whatever thing it was that they weren't doing that they could have been doing and I was like I, I can't move the battleship I just put me on a little you know small inflatable boat off to the side and I'll just go in my own direction yeah Okay. That's so great. What month was that? Oh, you said March, March, March of okay. 2006. Okay. So did you have the means to just kind of rest back a little bit or did you like no. you needed to make money, right? No, I, I needed I to imagine. make money. I mean, I had, yeah, I needed to make money and I had ongoing matters and I felt like, you know, I know that these matters, you know, I can depend on making X amount. I knew roughly what I could make for at least six you know, months to 12 months. And I knew which clients, or I, I thought I knew which clients would go with me. And okay. in 80% of the cases, I was correct. I mean, it was conservative, but you know, in 80% yeah. percent of the cases, I was correct. But one of the cases was kind of surprising to me because that was the one I, the one that I thought for sure would go with me was one that was, it was a patent litigation type case where the, uh, the law firm that did the patent work just needed local counsel to just be their contact with the local federal court. And one of the things I thought that I would be able to develop as a business model, I was hoping would work, um, which had nothing to do with technology, but was just like, well, when they hire Gordon Arata, the firm, the firm I was with, and pay us a lot of money to be local counsel, really, it goes from either just rubber stamping what they tell us to file and, and just be on the pleadings because they needed that to offering some advice. And I wouldn't take the rubber stamping cases unless I trusted the people to do the right thing. Uh, but the firm would. <laughs> so that was one where I didn't, you know, I was like, I'm not going to do that, but I'll take the ones that I, you know, if they want me to just be on the pleadings, but I trust them because they know what they're doing. Yeah, fine. But in most cases, the ones that trust you that way, and then I trust, were going to ask me my opinion. And I knew how that court worked. I mean, I had clerked for one of the judges who was really good there for two years. And afterwards, he set up the inner court group. And, you know, so I knew all those federal judges when I was there and on an ongoing basis. So I knew how that court worked. And that information was valuable. And I figured that this guy would keep me on and he would have except that the client was like, I don't know, do we want a guy that's a solo lawyer? Won't they get jammed? Won't they have these problems? And they had all these fears mm. that I was like, oh, how interesting. Mm. Like none of these fears are valid. Like if you're doing all the work mm. and all I have to do is file it and e-filing was coming into existence at this time, it was like, where, where is there going to be the bottleneck? There's not going to be one, but they, they just couldn't wrap their head around it. So they kept Gordon Rada and then another wow. client that I thought was going to keep Gordon Rada shifted to me for exactly that reason. Like, oh, we, we just use you for your advice and, you know, mm. 
surely okay. you'll figure it out or engage people or do whatever you need to do. You, we've trusted you, so we'll, we trust you and not the institution. So mm -hmm. it was kind of interesting to see how people didn't get that. And that's probably where if I knew what I know now about marketing, I wouldn't have assumed that they would just understand the benefits. I'd know that I have to explain it to them carefully. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. Okay. Uh, yeah. So knowing what you know now, you probably could have converted them. Mm -hmm. if you or I'd have had a better chance. I mean, I, I just yeah. assumed that was, that's the problem with a lot of marketing. You just assume people are going to know your value and you can't do that. You have to break it down and explain it yeah. to them and persuade them. Yeah. Um, you know, interestingly, so I guess I would say this to you in a one-off conversation, but other people might be interested in knowing this. Uh, have you heard of the book, hundred million dollar offer? It's no. new and it's like mm. a dollar on, I haven't read it yet. A dollar mm. on Amazon for like the, the Kindle version. Um, but Joey mm. Vitale this morning in a sprint, the sprint call, his lesson was around something he got from that book, which gave a calculation for the value of the thing that you're trying to sell, which was mm. so interesting, but he was talking mm. about how to, how, and the calculation will actually help you convey the value. Cause you have to mm -hmm. articulate what it is to be able to put it into an equation. And I, I don't know, sorry for listeners. I don't oh, know the equation yeah. off the top of my head, but it, so he Just said, get he the was, book. <laughs> yeah, he said he was really, um, floored by it that he'd huh. never seen it talked about in that way and it just goes like with what you're saying you have to be able to articulate the value to people and yeah. that's that's a tough learning curve i think um it is it is because people have a mindset and i see this constantly and i see it because i had the mindset right like yeah. if, if all you've ever done is well one not think about you know value at all and just say well you know my value is like you know at gordon rada they charge you know 350 dollars an hour for my time so that must be my value um well how did they come up with that number they i don't right. know they just you know they just they just came up with it and and our value was based on we're trading time for services and so the business model of lawyers is kind of flawed because you have this inherent conflict with your clients because you make more money if you're charging to, you know, by the hour, the more hours you spend. So what's your incentive to find quick solutions or to, to say, well, you know, the risk of this is not worth the time spent. So we're, you know, like you say, oh, we can't tolerate risk. We're just going to do everything we can. We're going to turn over every stone. Clients actually don't want that. They just don't know how to tell you. And they assume you would know that you, the lawyer would know what you probably shouldn't do. And then they get these fat bills and they're like, oh, okay. So the, they've learned, right? So that, that system doesn't work. But then if you're transitioning away from billing for your time and you say, well, I'm going to bill for value, this is flat fee pricing. Well, what's the value? Where's the, the happy, you know, marriage of the two of the one, the client wants something that they can afford and they're willing to pay for, and you need to make a profit and you know, it's going to take time, but you have to figure out how much time these things generally take. Well, that's what business businesses do right and if you can't figure it out then maybe that's not where you start with building your flat fee um model mm -hmm. and then once you get a flat fee model that works you're going to find like wow i like this this is great like i can mm -hmm. I, I get more people to sign up it's more cost efficient for them it's more co it's effective for me and i can scale this better mm -hmm. like just hire you know like so lawyers have had to learn this and i was one of those lawyers and, you know, you just don't tend to think, look, what's the value to the client? That's what they're looking for. Yeah. I mean, if you make a million dollar problem go away for $10,000, they're happy. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So, okay. I'm thinking back to, to when you left, you had some client work to do. And then when did you start? So, so I guess my question is when you started was it law firm autopilot at from the gate from the get-go oh no no I, I started the my solo practice did that for right seven to eight years and then i started doing the i was doing the they overlapped so i was doing uh -huh. the side gig business because people were saying well i want to pay you for you know for this extra service I was like, oh great and then i realized i could even run my own events 
and, uh -huh. and I was, you know, getting CLE credit and running my own events and that was making money. And I was like, wow, this is great. And then we started doing online CLE because um, I had a partner at the time and I thought, this is amazing. They click a button, money goes into the bank account, they watch a video and we don't even have to show up. We just process the, 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 their CLE credit and give it to the, you know, CLE authorities. And I was like, huh, what else can I do that's like this? And that's right about the time that people are starting to offer online education, online consulting, and those kinds of things. And I thought, hmm, I could probably do this and probably would enjoy this more because this is, you know, less dependent mm -hmm. on things outside of myself. So that whole thing about being self-sufficient that I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier that was always in the back of my mind. Like, how can I do more where thing where I don't depend on me being in a certain place, me having all this equipment, me paying rent for this office that I only use sometimes? How can I maximize what technology has enabled and teaching people and helping people online, you know, is like the supreme maximization of that. Yeah. Yeah. So so it was a transition into well when you when you started doing sort of one-off things or you did the cle work and it was like huh okay hmm. maybe i can do other things with this that was the beginning of what now is law firm autopilot when did it solidify into when did you create a business for it specifically so i think when i realized that i needed to take the business to another level was um, I realized that the marketing magic that I had with my solo firm, because I had started the fifth blog by a lawyer mm. and had all this acclaim and attention and awareness and all that stuff that you now is hard to get. I had it simply by virtue of that fact. And that magic started not to work. And it definitely didn't work as well when I transitioned to a completely new thing, because at that point, you know, people, what they, you know, your brand is one thing and now you have to rebrand and rethink the message and all that kind of stuff. And that's when I re started to realize in a dim kind of uh, primitive, you know, one celled organism crawling out of the primordial soup kind of way, <laughs> I started to realize like, you know, I don't really know marketing. Like it's not as easy as just get a website because everybody has a website now and that's not just the only thing you need. And so I started to look around and research and read more. And I was like, oh, there's actually a methodology to this. And oh, look at this. There are a whole bunch of people, non-lawyers, of course, because lawyers are going to figure this out last, but non-lawyers who figured out that they could build an online business mm -hmm. and sell information products. You know, Dan Kennedy was one of them. Tim Ferriss was one of them. And I was like, Oh, wow. Okay. And Tim Ferriss was really the one who like his book for our work week opened my eyes. And I was like, okay, well, how do we do this? And so I treated it like a legal research project where I wanted to see as many different people as possible. So I could see what the commonalities were. And I spent a lot of time, energy, money researching that. And then I realized, okay, that was my problem. I'm not clear in my marketing. And so I hired somebody to help me redo my website homepage. And I paid her $900, $997, which to me was like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> $900 for a homepage? My God, this is crazy. Because I had been right. like kludging things together. Right. And my mindset was like, spend as little money as possible because that's what's so amazing about digital is that it's inexpensive. And then I realized like, no, you know, knowledge and wisdom matter and you shouldn't, you can't only get them from books. Mm -hmm. You can try, but that takes longer and you have less confidence that you're doing it the right way. So I paid her. She looked at my, my email marketing. and he's like, Ernie, what are you doing? You're asking people for email addresses and saying, just subscribe and nothing more. You're not explaining the benefits. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here, let me help you with that. And so she changed some things. I was like, Oh my God, look at that. So much more effective. Yeah. When, you, when somebody who knows what they're doing with marketing takes the steering wheel. So that's yeah. when I really went to town on learning marketing. Okay. Oh, and how, so what year did you first, uh, what year did law firm autopilot 
begin, even though there was a really soft beginning for a long time. So Paperless Chase, if I looked at my LinkedIn profile, I think that started in 2012. And that was the name of the company. Oh, okay. Well, it was actually another name that I won't even get into, but it was Paperless Chase was when I realized like niche marketing, what am I going to be known for? I got to pick one thing out of this digital grab bag. So I said, well, I'll just teach people about being paperless. That'll be the focus. So that was the name of the company. So 2012, I was still practicing law. Then Law Firm Autopilot was a newer name, newer branding. And I forget when that, when that came into existence, but you know, I, Paperless Chase 2012 was when, uh-huh. you know, I really started to say, okay, I'm going to make this work. It was still overlapping, but I'd say for two years, then, you know, it was all in on just no practicing of law. You know, what's interesting. I mean, I know most of the people listening to this will be attorneys, um, but the show is not about attorneys, right? It just happens Mm -hmm. to be uh, that, but I, I agree with, so Allie Katz was on your podcast recently Mm -hmm. and she said something I was like yes 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 like there's something Mm -hmm. it's kind of like I knew it in the back of my mind but I had never said it that way that attorneys are really lucky that they have a skill to build a business around it's a very Mm -hmm. clear if they want to go out on their own there's some clarity there yeah and the difference between that and it's an advantage by the way but the uh well you could argue there's advantages on both sides but the difference between that and what you're explaining is you had to follow your nose and find your way to what this business was. And Mm -hmm. that is the coolest thing to me. I think, you know, I think that's why a lot of people in the world, non-attorneys is kind of what I'm talking about right now, but I think that's why a lot of people don't become entrepreneurs is because you have, you have an innate curiosity that, well, there's a lot of characteristics that I think lend itself to this with you, but you have an innate curiosity. You just keep following your nose and you keep, yeah. you know, I can like see your head back then, like kind of cock your head to the side, like, hmm. and then you kind of go with the next thing. And it built onto itself to pretty quickly to, to be the beginning of what blossomed into what you have now. But yeah, I don't know if you agree with that or not, but it's, it strikes me as there's advantages on both sides, I think. But yeah. it's, go ahead. Yeah, I think so. I've had, I've been thinking about like, how do I explain yeah, my origin story? Because there's another thing you have to do in marketing is you, mm-hmm. and you should do it if for no other reason than just to, to better understand what your strengths, weaknesses, and all that kind mm-hmm. of stuff are. And so when taking inventory, like, okay, well, what things was I naturally going to do anyway that mm-hmm. benefited me? And so, like I said earlier, you know, in my upbringing, Um, I had to figure things out on my own as a kid, you know, my parents were in a custody battle and they were busy doing different things. And they also, you know, they were naturally people who had to figure things out on their own and they traveled. And so their attitude about raising a child, they were the opposite of helicopter parents. Mm -hmm. They got in the helicopter and flew away, you know, and left me and my brother to figure things out, which was, I mean, I, I wasn't even perplexed by that or unsettled by that. I was unsettled by other things, but it was like most of my life was, yeah, just figure it out. And that turns out to be in this new world where we've had radical shift away from a traditional way of working and the traditional industrial age to this knowledge worker age, but then adding on to it, the digital part, because, you know, in the early part of the 19th of the 20th century, Peter Drucker talked about knowledge workers. I think he's the one that came up with the term, namely, you know, people who think for a living. So if you're a manager in a business, you think for a living, you're a knowledge worker. And the knowledge worker business has become really big now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so thinking for a living is what lawyers do. Like we were knowledge workers mm-hmm. always. Mm-hmm. And now we are knowledge workers in a digital age, a globalized internet in a driven age. Mm-hmm. So the opportunities are many to reach people who want to engage our thinking services and pay us a lot of money for high level thinking, not low level thinking. Mm-hmm. The problem is most of us are mired down in the putting out fires, you know, the data wrangling, information processing, that's low level work that is either being automated, outsourced to low, 
you know, job, low wage places, or it shouldn't even be done at all, you know? And so if you're down there doing that, uh, like, you know, you're creating a better, you know, for, like the time is over to create legal zoom that was created by legal zoom, but there was a guy, uh, named Ted Nicholas, who did this in 1997, who wasn't even a lawyer and made millions of dollars selling forms online. Lawyers could have figured that out. That, that's easy now. What's harder now is using critical thinking skills to solve high level problems for people who want those kind of problems solved. But here you have the same problem I had that I discussed earlier, which is if that's what you do and you, sh you should be doing that and you can be doing that if you're a lawyer, presumably, um, well, then you need to communicate to the client how that works. Why should they hire you to do that? Mm -hmm. Why is that a valuable thing? And it's a new thing. So clients aren't going, get me a, you know, look, search the web for lawyers who provide critical thinking skills. That's not going to show up in a Google search mm -hmm. uh, and people aren't going to search for that. So you have to explain it to them. Look, I can solve your problem. Now, here's the simplest explanation for that. I will charge a flat fee for this. They're like, oh, well, you figure this out. But that's still kind of low level, right? If it's flat fee, regular work, subscription-based pricing, now we're moving into a higher level because you're saying, you're going to need me to answer these kind of questions on an ongoing basis. I've figured out a good value exchange for you and me to do this. But that needs to be explained to people because, you know, one, they're not expecting it from most lawyers. And secondly, mm -hmm. they're going to assume it just naturally benefits the lawyer, People are very suspicious of how lawyers charge for things. So mm -hmm. you need to figure all that out, but that's what your critical thinking skills are for, right? You should be able to figure this out. And there are other people who have figured it out. So you don't have to figure it out on your own. You can find people who have figured it out. And that's, that's where I save myself time and energy, not as quickly as I would have liked, but you know, eventually I figured out, oh, wait, there's other people who've already figured this out. And a lot of it also is not, oh, let me chase people who are teaching the new shiny object thing. It's more like, well, what are the timeless principles here? You know, like Jeff Bezos was asked, and I think this is kind of a famous question. Oh, well, what's the new thing? You know, where's the, where's it, where are we going? And Bezos is like, new thing. I'm looking for things that have been around that aren't changing. That's what I'm looking for. That's what I can build a business around. Like if things are changing all the time, that, that's not sure footing that I'm on. That's, you know, that's things that's changing too much. So in a world that's changing a lot, you have to like figure out what parts of this are essential and timeless and mm -hmm. build your foundation on that. that. But that's part of your critical thinking skills is to figure that out and figure out how to build a business around that. Whether it's as a traditional lawyer or it's as a lawyer who's doing, you know, not representing clients with legal problems, but it doesn't matter because lawyers can represent, can do work that's not traditionally legal, just like people who are not lawyers, because this is happening now, can invade the previously only lawyers could do this world. Right. That's why that guy, Ted Nicholas in 1997, figured out how to sell forms online and made millions of dollars. This is, this is a, a case study that came out of Dan Kennedy's book. Uh, I forget what it's called, something like How to Make Money with Your Ideas, which Tim Ferriss cited as one of the only four books that mattered to him uh, in four hour work week. So if you, you know, if you trace back, you know, the roots of things, you can find out a lot of this stuff has been figured out. These are principles. Yeah. You want to learn principles, not tactics. Oh, totally agree with that. Um, I am curious if do you have any principles or philosophies that tend to stay close to top of mind for you? Mm -hmm. like, yeah. Okay. I mean, I mean, I think of them, you know, I think, well, actually it's, it's interesting because I'm about to, my next podcast I'm going to do is about critical thinking and I have a list of books mm. and I kind of was breaking this down to do that podcast episode. So this is top of the mind for me. And I, I, I guess I try to think of ways to make it so you know it's the 80 20 rule like what are the 20 percent of things that are going to give you 80 percent of the results because i can manage a smaller range of things better in my mind and elsewhere than i can if i have like the comprehensive list so i can give people comprehensive lists where i can say look these three things maybe 
are the keys to most of what you need to understand. And I think the three keys are uh, one to, you know, you need to be learning new things in this new world, you know, being curious um, in my case, that was natural for me. I was always naturally interested in how do things work? Not everything, but things that matter to me. You can, you need to be curious about the, this world, this particular situation that we're in that, the digital stuff is disrupting, which is creating new challenges and creating new opportunities. And so you need to be curious curious about how can I leverage those new opportunities? And there are people that you can help you with that because they'll be telling you things and you go, oh, that's an interesting idea. So you got to be open-minded and curious to develop those things. And you need to be open-minded and curious no matter what, because <laughs> there are challenges too. And those challenges are going to impair your ability to function unless you move to higher ground. So if your business model is you at the lower level of, oh yeah, managing data and I'm processing information, uh, you know, I'd like to get to that critical thinking thing when I have the time, but I'm busy putting out fires. If that's you, you're, the tsunami is going to take you out mm -hmm. soon. So you need to seek higher ground, A, to stay alive and B, preferably to thrive. So curiosity is your friend and learning new things. You, you, you can't stop learning. This, you know, we're, we're past, oh yeah, I learned that one thing that I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And that job is going to stay here. That's gone. So that's one. And then two is self-sufficiency, which I talked about earlier and I've hinted at. And I think the more self-sufficient you are, the less disruptible you are, the more options you have. And the happier you're going to be because having lots of options is good. There's, there's a book that I've been reading and which I will definitely recommend here as well as in the podcast that I mentioned. It's called The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. And I actually have a copy of it right here because oh, oh, it's, oh, well, it's, not gonna show. it's blurred out because I've got the Zoom background. Oh, yeah. Um, but it it is an amazing book and mm. it just brings together so many different things like decision making part of which is risk assessment. And it, it's, you know, it's in the finance area, but if you learn how to do it in the finance area, you can apply that understanding to everywhere else. Mm. That's why Charlie Munger, lawyer, good critical thinker, good person who's curious about the world and wanted to learn, you know, he is a person who learned how to apply these kinds of principles, which include psychology to investment. And if you can make good investment decisions, good finance decisions, um, you're going to be able to apply those principles elsewhere. And so self-sufficiency is part of that equation. And in the book, he talks about how there's a difference between being rich and wealthy. Rich is you have lots of money. Wealthy is you can do whatever you want as much as you, as you want. Mm -hmm. And so if you use money correctly and build it up, then you can, and you make the the right decisions and use the right principles, you will be wealthy. You will be able to do what you want, when you want, how you want. That was my goal when I went out on my own. I didn't know it. I wasn't as clear about it. I just knew I don't care about money. I want options. I want to be able to do things the way I want to. And so I was optimizing for that as much as I could without defining that. If I'd have defined it, I think I would have gotten there sooner, but I'm here now. And I can tell you that this book, after all the stuff I've, I've read, this book really nails it to the extent that I've read, I'm reading it, carefully highlighting it. I'm re going to reread it and reread it and reread it because it is just, it's like the hub for a bunch of other books. Oh, that's so, okay. Hang on, I'll write that down. Wait, Psychology of Money. It's called The Psychology of Money. And the subtitle is Timeless Lessons on Wealth, Greed, and Happiness. And the author is Morgan Housel, House, like the house, and then just add an L at the end. And it, you know, it was blurbed or touted by Jason Zweig, who's a Wall Street Journal. And this guy was a Wall Street Journal writer. He's, a, he's, he's invested, he's made money, but he's also a writer. The writing is an exception. It's an exceptionally well-written book in the mm -hmm. top 0.001% of books. But it's, it's blurbed by the following people. I think you know them. Daniel Pink, James mm -hmm. Clear of Atomic Habits fame, and Annie Duke of Thinking and mm -hmm. Bets fame. Yeah. 
And so I was I was expecting it to be pretty good because other people had recommended it. I am blown away at how good it is. Cool. Okay. Okay, so the the first principle the top of my open, you know, be be learning. be curious, be curious and open minded. And then um and and then you know, critical thinking decision making and there's a lot of books that you could read thinking and bets yeah. is one um, but the psychology of money i think i think people can learn to make decisions better when they have something that's 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 in their you know that they're dealing with to make decisions and the best thing i think is money because you you know everybody's managing finances and people tend to do it poorly for predictable reasons and yeah. you know daniel kahneman's covered this that's why they gave him a nobel prize for economics um, so that, you know, it's been covered and a lot of it has to do with psychology, hence the name, the psychology of money mm -hmm. is super important. Um, the other thing, the other component I think is you need to wrap your head around the big picture of what is happening in the world today. There's a lot of stuff that is, I mean, tectonic plates are moving rapidly and the, you know, there's several books, I guess you could read about this, but the best one that's current and he's, he's somebody who's paying attention to this. So it's a twofer. You'll learn about this person. You should follow anyway. And you can read the book. And it's called Post Corona by Scott Galloway. Huh. Scott Galloway is somebody that everybody who wants to understand what's going on in the world today should follow. Follow him on Twitter. He's great on Twitter. Follow, you know, subscribe to his YouTube channel. Listen to his podcast, one of which he does. I think he has more than one. But one is with Kara Swisher who's pretty famous in the tech world. I like and her interviews. She yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. And this book post Corona, he cranked out pretty quickly. A lot of it based on his blog posts and his thinking that he was already doing, but it, he, he is a clear thinker. There's not a sentence that comes out of his mouth that isn't a writer downer. Yeah. And, he, and he processes a lot of data, you yeah. know, so you don't have to, because <laughs> I don't, I don't like dealing with the data and crunching the numbers, but he does. Yeah. And that book, Post Corona, that's your playbook for mm -hmm. here. Let's review what isn't going to work anymore, what's about to crater, and what was stress tested during this pandemic and we know is going to take off. And if you're armed with those things, you know, you're you're 80% armed. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that. All three of those are so good. There's things I thought of that I wanted to ask you about with with um at least the first two um i'll go and order my questions sure. that popped in my head so have you ever heard that i don't know where i first heard this but the opposite of depression is curiosity not hmm. happiness no because i like think that you're either depressed or happy but the opposite is actually curiosity and mm -hmm. that has stuck with me ever since I learned that. Um, and you're mentioning how important curiosity is. So it almost seems to, it's important for a lot of things. One of them is well being. <laughs> oh, know? yeah. No, for sure. Yeah. Um, so I thought that was, that was cool. I was going to ask you. Well, that's that. interesting because so my dad was a psychoanalyst, psychiatrist, you know, mm -hmm. he comes from that world. And my mom had, um emotional um trauma problems and so i you know i've paid attention to that and i've talked to my dad about depression and people have depression and so whenever i hear those studies and i i, I just i process that information quickly and easily mm -hmm. and one of the greatest antidotes to depression apparently is activity like mm -hmm. if you get up and do stuff, you know, yeah. you'll be less depressed. So it's like, you know, chicken egg. Well, if you sit there and don't do stuff, it's because you're depressed. Well, if you don't do stuff, you're going to stay depressed. Right. So go do stuff, right? And doing stuff doesn't just mean physically doing stuff. It could mean going and checking stuff out. Right. So yeah, curiosity would be an antidote yeah. to depression, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, uh, but it is hard. So I have, my mother has, um, a really hard time also uh with depression mm -hmm. and there's there's just a lot there and always has been right mm -hmm. and so it's interesting to watch someone you love so much or anyone close to you 
who is depressed and just for the sake of this conversation, I'll even say clinically depressed. I, you see the struggle of being able to even muster up anything to go about curiosity. And I've had those moments myself, just yeah. not chronically, like I've, like right. I've witnessed and it's so hard. It's so mm -hmm. hard. Cause sure. You know, but it is what you're saying is when you're in a mode where, when you're out of the darkest of the dark, when you can, you even have a, like a, just a flicker in your mind of the possibility of learning or the possibility of activity of some sort, you shouldn't, you should act on it because the right. second that you could do it, it starts to spiral you up instead of the spiral down that can happen so easily when you, you don't feel like you're in a place to, you can't even, you don't even want to want to want to do it. Right. <laughs> um, right. So anyway, yeah. Yeah. And, and in the extreme level, you know, of course we're talking about the extreme, but let's just talk about the more common thing, which is yeah. people not believing that they can do something right. Because I, what I see, and I know you see this, we both see this is a lot of people you're sitting there going, yeah, you can totally do this thing. And they're like, well, no, I don't think I can. You know, in my case, it's like, I'll tell them, look, you can take advantage of technology. Oh, no, I can't because I don't really like technology. It confuses me. I'm too old. Mm -hmm. You don't have to like it. You don't have to understand all of it. Just like you don't have to understand yeah. how your car works. You know, you can pull into the gas station, have them change the oil for you. It's right. the same with technology. But what you what you shouldn't be doing is wasting time. Yeah doing the wrong things. So it's uh -huh. not just about being efficient. And so people get that wrong with technology. Oh, I'll use it to be more efficient. No, no. First be effective. Like don't do things you like it's the David, I mean, the Peter Drucker quote, there's nothing so useless as doing efficiently. That's what shouldn't be done at all. So it's learning what you should and shouldn't be doing in this fast changing world. And everyone can learn it. It's mm -hmm. the Carol Dweck book, you know, the growth mindset, yes. everyone can learn. And believing that you can learn comes when you learn things that you didn't believe you could do. And they go, Oh, look at that. I learned how to do that. That's amazing. And then, then you will learn. Right. So, but the, you want to get that confidence, mm -hmm. you know, from, if you need to get it with a coach, then get a coach because a coach is going to keep you from going off the rails and wasting time and getting unnecessarily frustrated because once you catch the wave, you know, and once you get the gist of what's going on, you know, everyone can learn to do this. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not like only a few people can learn it. What most people are doing wrong doesn't depend on what how tech savvy or whatever it is. It depends on them being really focused on doing the right things. Yeah. Right. Like there's so much, there's so many things competing for people's attention. Mm. It's so easy to get derailed. That's the problem is we live in a world where it's, it's like a forest fire and we're surrounded uh -huh. by fires and we can't put them out. So we better learn how to avoid them or throw a tarp over ourselves so that we can survive in the midst of this blaze. That's what it's like in this world of attention grabbing stuff. So yeah. you need to figure out how to maintain your attention, how to focus on the right things and stay focused on a few of those things yeah. until you get the benefits. And, you know, I know, cause I've been in your sprint, that's what you help mm. people do. And you help me get better about doing it because there's something about working with somebody every day, or, you know, in your case, you know, five days a week mm -hmm. and saying, okay, well, what are you working on? Are you still working on that? Yep. Good. Okay. Did you have any problems working on that? Okay. Let's talk about, it. you know, and then you realize, Oh, look at that. If I stay focused on something, I get mm -hmm. results. And, yeah. you know, you don't need a lot of results all over the place. You need a few right. big results, which all of which the things that matter all depend on sustained effort and focus and attention, which is like the most rare element on planet earth these days. Yeah, that's so true. It also makes me think too, because there's sometimes we're going for a particular result, but there's times where you just know something isn't quite how it should be. Mm -hmm. And it, it's almost, I think our need at times or our perceived need for an answer, almost like the urgency or immediacy that, that you wish an answer would come squashes creativity or curiosity. Yeah. It's like, you just are, if you just sit with, sit in the question yep. for a while, yep. the yep. curiosity is allowed to play. And like, I wonder yeah. about this, or I wonder about this instead of needing or grasping for like, well, what's next? How do I fix yep. this? Um, right. 
Yeah. yeah. Cause we don't, we don't like uncertainty. So this is, again, if you go back right. and study our psychology, like this is, you know, don't feel bad if you feel like this, cause everybody feels like this. Why? Cause it's factory installed in every human being that we need to make decisions quickly. We don't like the uncertainty. Well, yeah. okay. That, that was before there was a digital world and now it's a digital world. It's like a pinball arcade and all these things are flying at us. So we want to make a lot of these decisions just to get rid of the problem quickly. So then we get in the habit of making decisions quickly, but it's a whack-a-mole game. Like the, you, yeah. there's going to be 17 more decisions after you make the one you made, but the ones that matter most, you're right. You need to do well on, you need to sit with, and this is where I love the, the UDA model, you know, which I talked about in one of my podcasts, the observe, orient, decide and act, which was developed by this guy, John Boyd, who taught fighter pilots how to make better decisions well in dog fights. So the, the time frame of their UDA decision-making is nanoseconds or seconds, but it's the same concept. It's like, don't decide until you have observed what's really going, going on, right? Yeah. Take stock of the situation. So if you have time, use the time to take full stock of the situation, see what's really going on. So be non-reactive, you know, step one and observe. Step two, orient, put things in perspective. Take a look at everything else that's going on around it and see, you know, is this the most important thing? And that's what, you know, what, you know, when Peter Drucker says, don't waste time, this would be the methodology for not doing the wrong thing. Oh, yeah, okay, I was about to do this. Well, that was going to be a waste of time. Like, I mean, right. in marketing, it would be, oh, I, I, I need to make more money. So I need, I need to get more followers because then I'll have more attention. And I can, I'll, I'll, I'll buy Facebook ads or I'll, I'll go on social media and I'll get a lot of people to follow me and then, and then, and then I'll have people and I'll make money, okay? No, that's not going to work. Your, your system for getting more clients or customers needs to be one, who do I want to work with? Mm. Who do I not want to work with? Mm -hmm. What kind of work do I like doing? Let me create messaging to attract those kind of people. Is that going to be something I'm going to do in an afternoon? Nope. It's going to take a long time. You're always going to be working on it in the beginning. And at some point, maybe you stop work. But, you know, it's going to take a while to get that. And if you get that, then at the end, go get the attention of people if you need more attention. But you might not. It might be that if you send the right message out, and this was like my epiphany, um, I accidentally sent the right message out when I started a blog. And then I started studying marketing and trying to be strategic and became wooden and clinical and not effect, not as effective. And then I realized like, no, I just, why don't I just be me? Why don't I just speak like I speak, not hire people to speak for me and say what, what needs to be said. But of course I had to figure that out, right? Like, and that's right. hard, you know, you, you work with people. This is where the, the critical thinking and the thinking skills that's why they're so valuable because mm -hmm. thinking doesn't mean just reflexively responding to things. It means understanding with depth, yes. you know, like going below the surface, seeing root causes. Like that's what people will pay you. I mean, even if they don't know that's what you're doing, the, the results you deliver by doing that will be way better. Yes. So that's Definitely. what people should focus on. Definitely. This, this kind of, the other thing I was going to say to you, it feels like connected to this about the second principle you gave, you talked about rich is different than wealth, being rich mm -hmm. is different than being wealthy. And the, you know, you gave the difference there and it feels like with getting rich people, that's almost like a, that's probably a moving target, but there's like a destination that they, it is not their life. They're trying mm -hmm. to get that life. Right. And then being wealthy is something that no matter where you are on the journey of accumulating wealth, and I mean like all kinds of wealth, not just money, you can, you can feel wealthy. If you just wake up to the truth of some things, you can feel yeah. wealthy in any given moment. You may not be able to feel rich in any given moment, but that's kind of the beauty. I think being wealthy is, uh, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with being rich, but being wealthy is a yeah. different game, a deeper, more fulfilling game. That's like, that's what right. it's about. You yeah. could be wealthy with very little money. Oh, you know, that's yeah. the thing. Oh, and yeah. Tim Ferriss, I don't know if, I think this was in the four hour work week, but I came across it recently and somebody 
cited it as being in the four hour work week. So I have to go back and check, but I've, I've told the story. I, I forgot where I'd gotten it from, but it's probably from Tim Ferriss. And it was about how, you know, there's this guy who's really wealthy. He's like a, you know, money guy in New York. And he goes down to fish at this village in let's say Mexico. And he meets this guy named you know, Julio and, you know, he likes Julio and he's telling Julio, you know, you're, you're doing good here, but you could do a lot better. You could come to New York. I could get you a job in the mail room. You could start there, you know, and he's like, well, that, what would I do then? He goes, well, then you go up and eventually you know, like you'd make all this money. And I said, well, if I had all this money, what would I do? He goes, well, then you could afford to come to a nice place like this. Mm. Ta-da. You know, like yeah. <laughs> he's already there. Right? He's happy. He's there. You, rich guy, went there because you want to spend your time and have a quality experience. He does this every day. Yeah. And he doesn't have it doesn't cost him a lot of money. He's already there. But like people will chase those things without understanding what they're chasing. Right. And not because they're not clear about whether they want money or wealth. And usually if people want money, it's either because they want the wealth, the freedom, and you know, there's a certain level of amount of money you have to have. I mean, I think the number in the U S supposedly is like $72,000 or 74,000. And that's the level at which, you know, you can be happy because you can afford things you need to afford, but you know, either they want the wealth or they want status. Now, if you want status, yeah, that game's never going to end. Mm-mm, You'll be playing mm-mm. the money game and the status chasing game forever. But I don't really think people are satisfied by status. I think that's a substitute for something they haven't discovered. But, you know, I don't know, maybe maybe that's just because I don't want status that, you know, for me, it doesn't make sense. But yeah, I think yeah. status is a huge thing to try to because it's see again, self-sufficiency. If I want status, what does that mean? Well, I have to play this game where I don't really control a lot of things. It's all about other people's opinion. Whereas if I go, well, I'm going to train myself not to care about other people's opinion, other than the people who I'm going to use to understand better the things I need to understand, those people's opinion I will care about. But that's simply so that I can learn. If it's to give me approval, oh, well, now I've got an extra thing that I have, that's extra load I have to carry. I want to be as free of those loads. I want to be as free as unnecessary from an unnecessary dependencies as I can be. Yeah. And that's what I'm optimizing for because Mm -hmm. that's wealth to me. Mm -hmm. That's it's one of the reasons why on this podcast, I don't want to guess it's not that I'm not willing to talk to people all of all walks, Mm -hmm. all points in the journey, but the only guests I want on the show are people who don't need more from their business more like Mm. they don't like there's a graspiness and right. it's very natural. I mean, truly, when you're lifting something off the ground, the most important thing is new customers. Like, mm-hmm. that's, yeah, you that's have required, to, I mean, you do right? have to, yeah, you do yeah. need money for some things. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's a bit of a, um, maybe more, maybe not for you. You definitely seem like a Zen master to me, but there did, I think there's more of a grind and a hustle to, to lifting something off of the ground. Oh, and, for sure. Yeah. And so that, you know, I wanted people who have done that and they mm-hmm. aren't in that phase anymore. Mm-hmm. And they're the most interesting people for me to, the, to talk to because of the perspective and the experience and the wisdom that you gain from going through that. And you're at a point now where now it's more about with your business if you don't decide to retire and go sit on a beach, which most people that do this kind of work won't because there's something about it that they love with the building and all of that. So if you keep working beyond when you need uh, money, so to speak, then, then it gets interesting because you are playing a different game. It's not about the money anymore. Of course, it is from a bottom line perspective for the business, but you have more the ability to more aggressively put your foot on the gas with ideas and that maybe would have been too risky earlier because you needed some sort of security with what the result was going to be. And so, yeah, I mean, okay. You said definitely when you were lifting this off the ground, can you give any, any um, examples or just your experience of the way that you thought back then mm-hmm. 
that yeah. you had to think in order to lift yeah. versus the way that you think now. Yeah. And wait, one other caveat. Yeah. It has to be something. Well, what I'm curious about is it's not that it was wrong. And it's not that like if future Ernie, if now Ernie could give advice to past Ernie because of what you've learned, because of now what you understand, that might've been helpful in lifting something off the ground, mm -hmm. but you just knew yep. what you knew at the time and there was a hustle to it, right? I don't know, yeah. I'm curious what you would impart. Yeah, I know exactly what that is because not only do I know it for myself, but I see it with the people that I try to help because, yeah. and, I, and I see, I know you see this same thing because as we talked about it, we're, the things that are going to move the needle and give you this wealth or riches, if that's what you want for that matter, mm -hmm. um, they're long game things. Yes. There's nothing that I can think of that's short game that's worth dealing with until you figure out the long game stuff first. The problem with the long game, and this is why delayed gratification is the word we use. You know, it's like we want to be gratified right away. We want to know that we got the thing. But there's another part of gratification that's not just the getting the thing. It's also knowing that you're on the right path to get the thing, right? And how the hell are you going to know whether you're on the right path for this heavy lift that you're going to do that's going to require all this momentum? You know, I mean, I love your analogy that you've used before with me about talking about 80% of the fuel necessary to go, you know, to go to the moon is used up in the first whatever seconds. And that's what it is. That's, you know, there's a lot of work that you're putting in on the front end and you have to be aimed at the right target. And, you know, so it's, a, it's just, people aren't going to stumble on that I, is what I think. So like I groped around and made, and I went in a lot of different directions before I went in the, you know, the better direction. And so I, tr of course, would like to help people not do that, but I, I know that what they struggle with is even though intellectually and even if they trust me and say yeah I, I know it intellectually and i trust ernie or melissa when they say that this is what we need to do they get fidgety they mm -hmm. get they get um, insecure mm -hmm. because until you, this has worked for you one of these you know long range projects you don't really trust that it's going to work for you you have the imposter syndrome you have the insert you know you're like ah, i work for other people it doesn't work for me so until you see that start to work for you and you go, oh, yeah, okay, that's the deal. And then once you've had it work, you kind of stop and think, well, of course, that's going to be the secret. Of course it is. This is the secret. to the It's going to be the secret because what isn't the secret? Trying everything that everybody else is doing and running around in circles. That's not going to be the secret. The secret is going to be something that people aren't doing. It doesn't have to be things that people couldn't figure out easily those are secrets too, but the, you know, the, the weirdest secret is the one where, yeah, it's sitting right there. Every, you know, Warren Buffett will tell you how to make money. You know, it's not a secret. Uh, other people will tell you the secret, like compound interest is the secret, yes. you know, and that's one of the things that in the psychology of money, he talks about compounding works constantly everywhere, but who wants to do it? It takes a long time. People, right. they don't, they don't want to do that. Okay. Well, then you're not going to, that's the secret. Yeah. And, and, the, and, the, and there's no heavy lift there. It's just, that one's just, you have to keep doing it. Yeah. It's not, you put a lot of money in today. Well, you have it. So you put in as much as you can constantly. Don't miss a day. If you can possibly miss a day, that's, what's going to buy you the margin. That's, what's going to create the wealth absolutely guaranteed. And then you can take some risks, but the kind of risks you can't take are the ones that take you out of the game altogether. And yeah. here's where wealthy, I mean, rich people and maybe wealthy people too, they get taken out of the game. They blow it up. They, they think they're so smart. Their ego takes control of them. They make a big bet and they're wrong and they didn't have any room for error. Mm -hmm. You know, margin for error is another principle that Morgan Housel talks about in psychology of money. You must have margin for error. Now, there's, you know, you don't have to worry about that with compounding. That's going to take care of the job for you. But in other areas where you're making risky decisions, you cannot make, you cannot bet on things. I mean, it's like he uses the example of Russian roulette in the book. He's like, 
yeah, you can make a lot of money in Russian roulette, but what are the consequences of losing? You know, <laughs> so like, just think of that. Like, and it's 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 not hard to do the right thing. What's hard is to keep doing the right thing. Right. I was just listening to somebody the other day talk about uh, they used Charlie Munger, uh, but Warren Buffett talks about too compound interest and. Charlie Munger was saying when it comes to habits or just the small things, the things that don't take much time that don't that, but it's, it's the same thing that there's it, you get compound interest. It's the same effect that happens with yep. those habits or the, what I've yeah. been referring to lately is the, we things it's the, we things, but you have to keep doing them consistently. And if you stop, it's the same as taking like your investment out of the asset. And then yep. moving, you don't yep. get the compound interest. And so you yep. keep playing the short game. Yep. That's not going to get you forever. So I love that you said the long game. I actually, the podcast that went out yesterday was called the play the long game. Cause it's, that's it's it. this, right? Like, yep. you know, and I'm still on a journey with learning. I certainly right. don't know all there is to know or have all the experience in the world, but I do understand that you the weighing, weighing things out from that perspective of the long game versus the short game is the way to go. And it's sometimes yep. it's hard because you want a quick win mm -hmm. or you, or you feel like you need a quick win. And so you'll, you start to make stupid decisions <laughs> because yeah. Yeah. short term, short game. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's having that, that view. Yeah. Um, Okay. Do you have a few more minutes? Yeah. Okay. I would love to ask you, what is, what's a barrier that you are currently experiencing or dealing with that you're trying to, maybe, you're, maybe you're just sitting with it. Like you're kind of in that phase of this will get figured out, but this is something that I'm, that I want to figure out. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think the biggest one is health. Like I'm not really doing things to be healthy. Like there was a time and we, we talked about this right before the podcast started. Like there's a time when I was going to yoga regularly and, and this isn't because of the pandemic, but it's just kind of, there's been a lot of different things. And that's not my, I replaced my morning routine of running and working out with a morning routine of mental stuff. So I, you know, I journal, I meditate and I've said to myself, okay, well then I'm going to start doing some activity stuff when I feel like I have the time. And for a lot, for a long time, I was doing things where I was spinning my wheels. And then once I started to realize like, oh, no, I shouldn't have been doing that. I, should, I knew better. I shouldn't do that. Now I see things coming together and I guess there will be this moment and this, you know, maybe it could be a, right now or tomorrow, but I'm not in a hurry to figure it out. Cause I'm, I'm in good health. I'm not, you know, dragging. And I feel like whatever I can, you know, I need to do will shed pounds and bring me back up to speed once I start doing it, but I'm optimizing for other things because, you know, I only have so much time. Mm -hmm. So the things I'm trying to put in place with my time are things that are going to become uh, perpetual motion machines, you know, flywheel effect things in the business. Mm -hmm. And then I'll go like, well, I've got this extra time. Okay. What am I going to use it for? Well, I'm going to work out and work on my health more. Now that doesn't explain the nutrition because, you know, in nutrition, I should be better about this. That one doesn't require time. That just requires making better choices. But yeah, that's an area where I know yeah. I need to focus on that. Yeah. That makes total sense. And I, 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 number one, I admire how you're not in a hurry to figure that out. I'm asking myself that more and more. Like, why are you in a hurry? Why are you in a hurry? Like maybe there's something I want to change. And so I, I will, my tendency is to make a drastic call. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, I don't think I'm playing the short game. That's exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. when I do that. Like the other day I'm similarly with health stuff. I haven't really been paying attention to my physical health the way that I have in the past. And so my, I had this thought the other day, oh, I'm going to do 75 hard. What? Like, are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> right. it is not the, I mean, I could, I could totally do that, but I know better than to just mm. like go the, let the pendulum swing the other way quickly. Like, okay, wait, let's just not. And so I've been, 
I appreciate that you're saying as well. Like I, I'm contemplating it. I am figure. Mm-hmm. I will figure it out. And that feels, um, it's really, it's a healthy approach, you know? Well, and you, what you said about small things so that, so when I go, when I say, okay, I'm going to put that as a list on my things to do. Um, I know that the way I'm going to do it is ramp up slowly in the James, you know, clear atomic habits way, because if I try to do it too fast, well, that's, there you go. Like that's kind of risk and taking yourself out of the game. What, what if yeah. I injure myself because I'm pushing too hard? I don't need to push too hard. I just need to say, okay, this is going to be how we start with the baby steps. And then every yeah. day I'll just ramp up slowly because I'm playing the long game. I'm not playing right. the in a hurry game, but right. I, I, I feel like you do. Like, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah I'm going to join the gym. And I'm, Cause that's what we do. That, that is the that's monkey motivation. brain. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's the default setting to, to switch to that mode. So you, yes have to train yourself to be non-reactive and slow paced when that's what's called for. And it wasn't any easier for me to learn how to do it than it is for anybody. But I knew I need, that's one where I was like, I'm prioritizing for that Mm -hmm. because that will pay compound interest long-term in a bunch of different places. Yeah. And I think too, having a, some sense of whether it's just a buddy, but having some sense of community around the small steps, which I know that's what I do with the sprints, but that's not, that's not what I'm talking about. But the the small steps, like even with health, I was just thinking, oh, maybe I wonder if Ernie be in for like a, ch- a check in every day if we did start something similar. But and maybe not, right? But I do think that there's something about that the monk you were saying it's the monkey brain when we get all this like this motivation to make the change and mm-hmm. that that's a good idea i'm going to do that mm-hmm. and it's this intense regimen then mm-hmm. then the motivation's going to go away bank on right. it and right. then what now you're stuck in this thing where you're supposed to spend whatever 2 hours a day giving yourself right. to the like what are you setting yourself up for that is the short right. game even if you feel like it's not um but the I think accountability is like, that's never going to win that in my, for me speaking for myself and many people that I see do what you want. Right. But like that call, that extreme nature Mm -hmm. is like flame up, flame out kind of stuff. So the, the long game is, is the small things. How can you set yourself up to be engaged Mm -hmm. in the small things? Cause it doesn't, there isn't a kickback right away often. Well, well, you need accountability. You're right. I mean, or, or most people, most of the time need right. accountability. Yeah. And I think, it, and I know you'll know this book, uh, Triggers by Marshall Goldsmith. Is that the I have not read it. Somebody oh, okay. It. Because, I mean, he's one of those guys who, you know, he's an interest, it's an interesting book and an interesting person to study because he basically gets paid a lot of money to coach people who are super high level. And I think I remember reading in the book that like one of the ways he got into this was he would go to like, you know, let's say this, I'm making it, making this up, but let's say it's the CEO of Mm Coca-Cola and they say, I really need help. And they hire him. Well, the way he got, or one of the ways that he got people to understand that there was value there was he'd say, look, here's what I charge for this, but you know what? I'm going to do it for you for a year for free. And if you don't get the results you're looking for, then you don't have to pay me. But if, you know, so now the person knows, of course, they're going to really do the job. He has confidence because he's not going to get paid unless he gets results. So he'd get results for these people. But like he broke down the key thing was almost like the the net promoter score where they go, oh, look, this is just one question. And the one thing that he did that, that made the biggest difference, which in the book, he says, you can do this too without hiring me or anybody else is get accountability. So you ha- have a person and every day you say, and you don't have to get on the phone with them. You could do it by email and just say hey, in the beginning, in you know, morning, I'm going to do this today. And at the end of the day, you email them where they ask and, you know, email and say, yep, I did it or no, I didn't do it. You don't even have to necessarily explain, I think was how it worked. It's the mere fact that, you know, somebody is monitoring will cause people to do things that they would otherwise not do. Okay. Well, right that's a really powerful insight. Mm. And this is being given to you by somebody who isn't, you know, s- selling, you know, cheese and crackers. He, he did it at a high level, does it at a high level. 
And he's saying, you know, here's the 80, 20, 20, 80 rule. This is the key component of that. Now, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, you know, you know, it's better to have somebody who can give you advice, mm -hmm. you know, who's been down, you know, so there's other things that make it better, which is of course mm -hmm. why, you know, you have work because people hire you, you know, to, to give more than just accountability, um, strategic planning, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, the accountability, yeah, that's really important because okay. if, if you can't provide it to yourself, where are you going to get it? Not from right. an app. Yeah, no, that's so true. People, that's one of the number one things people say about what they're so pumped that they got out of this. Yes, the result, but they, they, they attribute it to the accountability mm -hmm. and I don't think they're wrong. I pushed so hard for so long, not, to, I don't want to just be an accountability coach. That's not what I'm going to market myself for, but that's, that's what people value. Right the most once they're in, right. I mean, you know, well, I mean, having been with through your sprint, I know that's not just what you do. And I mean, I don't know if you'd agree with what I am about to say, but I think what I saw happening with other people and with me was, yeah, there's accountability. That's important, but also you were helping people understand how to think about this so that they could think about it themselves. And that I've decided recently is, you know, I've rebranded and, you know, by deciding what am I really trying to help people do? And it's, you know, technology. Yeah. Okay. Technology that's at the surface level, but what I'm really trying to do is help people who want to shift their thinking in outside the box ways. Cause the old box, the traditional law firm box, the traditional business box that's over digital has disrupted that. So I would rather help people think about that better but I, th I see that that's what you're doing because it's not the thinking about it better is not dependent on technology. The mm -hmm. thinking about it better is pausing and reflecting. Okay, well, why did I think that was going to work? Oh, okay, well, that. And so, unless you get somebody working with you to develop that muscle, it's, you know, it more, you know, more people aren't going to do that. I was able to kind of figure a lot of it out on my own, but when I entered into mastermind groups and this was being discussed, Either the person asked me a question and, and stopped me in my tracks and made me think, huh, okay, why was I thinking that? Mm. Or I got to observe other people getting stopped in their tracks who were like super high level people. I was like, whoa, okay, well, people need coaches. I mean, Steve Jobs and Eric Schmidt of Google had a coach, Bill Campbell, that's a famous book, The Trillion Dollar Coach. And they, why did they pay this guy a lot of money? Or actually, I don't even think they did pay him. He got his, right. he did he did it because he loved doing it. And he had a, had all the money, and you know, to him, wealth was working with high level people and helping him. Um, but you know, they needed him. Yeah. What do they need him for? They're smart people. Right. Eric Schmidt can figure why because you because people need coaches. Why can't Tiger Woods have, figure out what's wrong with his swing? Right. You know, why does LeBron James have? Why do people have coaches? Because they can't do the thing and see themselves doing the thing yes. and spot the problems while they're doing the thing. That's, yeah. that's life, right? Yeah, totally. Have you seen people probably sick of me saying this, but have you seen never give in a documentary? No, um, you should look it up. I think it's on Paramount plus only, but, but you oh. can get Paramount plus for free for a week. Oh, okay. if you have Amazon. Right. Anyway, uh, it's about a coach, like, um, arguably, the greatest coach that's ever lived at least maybe up until recently um epl soccer coach football oh, coach. okay and he's scottish so you need to turn the subtitles on because it's really <laughs> right. it's hard to catch everything yeah. but oh the way that he gets out of people mm. really high level players that are best of the best in the world and he can turn them on by he said um some people call it in his awesome accent. Some people call it psychology. I call it management. It's just like you're managing the, the way that they're perceiving things and not because you're brainwashing. It's just, you're asking the right questions. You're pushing right. the right buttons and how important that, that can be. Um, and what a skill, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I think it's, it's a skill that can be developed over time, but is really good. I feel like you'd enjoy that. Oh yeah. And no, I already, I put it down on my list of things to uh, check out. Yeah. I, every time I talk to you, I have a list when I walk away. I love it. <laughs> we both, we both do. This is why <laughs> we can't meet every day. Cause we would never, then we would never get, anything, never done. get anything done. Yeah, exactly. <laughs>
<laughs> I know that's so true. Man, Ernie, thank you so much for coming on and, and just sharing how your brain works and how you think about things. Um, yeah. No, I love, I love talking to, to you. Yeah, same. I So for everybody listening, most people probably know exactly who you are, where to find, but yeah. can you just share a little bit about your business and what you do and where they can find you? Yeah, unfortunately I have two websites, but you know, either one will get you to the same place. Okay. Um, if you Google Ernie the Attorney, you'll find the Ernie the Attorney website. Um, if you Google Law Firm Autopilot, you'll probably find the Law Firm Autopilot website. I have a bunch of free resources there, and you know my my way of trying to help people get started is to do as much as I can by explaining upfront. Um, I do have like a, a PDF download that I'm working on revising. And it's really more about the emails that come out afterwards, because I feel like if you want to shift your thinking, it ain't going to happen overnight. And a lot of things need to be repeated and reinforced so that you can internalize them because the principles that matter most are the ones that you don't have to think about. You just train yourself to act upon them. And so when it comes to decision-making, to the psychology behind that, to marketing and how all these things fit together, it's, there's a lot to cover. And so I just do it by sending out a stream of emails that I'm constantly tweaking and updating and improving. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's the way to do it. Or you can listen to my podcast. That's also another option. Yes. It's a great podcast. Have, if you were to sum up, it's so hard, I think in, in a sentence, what you do for attorneys or for law firm owners, what is it? I help lawyers shift their thinking away from the traditional that's eroding and becoming less uh, effective mm. to new things that are effective. And yet at the same time, we're also going to talk about the things that haven't shifted, like compounding, you know, isn't mm. a new thing that's been around forever. So it's understanding which of the new things do I need to leverage and which ones should I leverage first and how do I think about the digital world? Um, one of the big insights that I've had, which seems so obvious now, and I mean, it was obvious, but it, I didn't understand the, imp the import of it, is that the thing that makes operating with all this digital stuff, you know, and doing our knowledge work so difficult is that, and this is so obvious, you know, digital information is invisible and intangible. If I want to observe the digital information, I have to open my computer. It's like a window into that world. And then I can access it and I can see it and work with it. So when, and this is another point that um, Morgan Housel made in psychology of money, because he was saying, well, how do we learn how to manage money? You know, you can't observe people doing it. He said, humans learn by imitation. And so you can't imitate people and learn them doing digital stuff at a high level, because where would you observe it? Like the only two chances you have are if you're standing behind them, the right person for long enough and watching what they do, which they're probably not going to let you do that, or they screen share, which happens very rarely. So how are you going to learn these principles and internalize them? It's very hard. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I realized like, you know, I'm not going to teach people tactics. Um, and I will help them. I will say, yeah, you know, acuity booking or whatever is good, or, you know, you should be paperless. The, the scan snap scanner is good, but you need to think about how do you, how do you learn what you need to learn? How do you get information quickly? How can you be self-sufficient? How can you use outsourcing? And it, these are principles problems, not tactics problems. Yeah. Which principle, principle Focus on principles is playing the long game. Yep. Tactics yep. is a short game. Yep. And you do need tactics. That's yes. true. 100%. But you need to know after you, the principle, yes. which tactic am I going to use to execute that principle? Right. Principle driven tactic execution. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Let's write that down. <laughs> that should be the title of this podcast episode. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> <sighs> that's great um well yeah this has been awesome thank you so so much and i mean 
I mean, we'll have more conversations in the future. For so this sure. isn't it, but For sure. and maybe someday, hopefully sooner than later, do something in person and live. Which yeah, is super cool. I would love that. Oh man, maybe. let's 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 talk about that. Yes, 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 definitely. All right. Cool. Thank you, Ernie. Yeah. Thanks.